It's stripped, cleaned, parts are ready to go back on. Let's wrap this up, all right? This Trek 5000 OCLV or TCT, whatever they want to call it these days. It's carbon fiber with a carbon fork. The paint had some scratches on it and so forth. Got that all cleaned up. But now we're ready to put this back together after this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin the guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. Taking scary out of used bikes one bike at a time. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin the guy. On this old bike series, we're looking at this Trek 5000. And yes, I'm talking really fast because I drank an energy drink. So this is going to go real quick. Eh, not really. But anyway, we're going to dive into this. I got the parts all cleaned up. They're actually been cleaning the sauna cleaner, scrubbed really hard. There's a couple little bits I couldn't really get off, but hey, I did the best I can. But got them all re -lubed and ready to go. The wheels came out wonderful uh, they're all nice and clean and true the rear wheel was a little out of true but other than that it was actually in good shape another thing i want to note too is on this alloy free hub body is since this bike this rim was not original for the oem or the wheel um, this one's alloy and you can kind of start seeing the notches to it a little bit the ones I've seen used a lot have really deep cuts into the alloy free hub body. It's just one of those things that comes with a free hub body, but that just shows that this wheel wasn't used very much at all. But anywho, let's just dive into this. All right, what I like to do is get the brakes on. Um, I did scuff the pads up so they're kind of cleaned up so they have a little better braking uh, surface and get that metal contaminants out of there because it'll pick up on those rims sometimes. I did lube the pivots. Um, after doing the sauna cleaning. So, so the easy way to know which ones are right and rear, obviously, is when you took it off and make note, but um, typically the front brake has a longer thread up in the back part. Also, you can look at the brake pads. If the little screw on the back part here needs to face to the back. Reason being the force of the rims going forward, so you want that rim to force that brake pad into the brake pad holder. If you have those on backwards, you can potentially have that brake pad slide off or rip off. Um, not likely, but it's it's a safety thing. So you want to make sure those little screws are on the backward direction on those on your bike. So you want to double check that. So on the front goes through the front fork here. Uh, sometimes it's stiff because of paint or what have you. Uh, I cleaned out most of the material. Uh, there is spacers on there. You want to make sure you get those spacers back on there when you put these back together. Um, that's pretty important. Um, pushing those brake pads away from the forks so they're not bumping up against that fork. I tighten it partially, but not all the way. Reason being is I want to be able to adjust that once I have the cables and housing in place. So onto the rear. So this rear one, you'll notice it has this long cylinder and these also have a lot of different sizes to them. So if you just get a brake, I go onto a bike that just looks like this, you'll need to figure out which ones of these are going to work for you. There's several different sizes. If you just get a frame set and you buy some brakes, you may have to look into different ones of these to the back bolt. So I want to put a little bit of grease on this guy. Whoa. Got the dropsies today. All right, so I put, like to put a little bit of grease on here. Reason being, it keeps the contaminants out and it doesn't seize up. Sometimes they can rust. You don't want that to happen. Um, rusting parts on your bike is no bueno. So you wanna get that in there and nice and snug. So once I get the brakes on, then I dive into the bottom and throw on the crank. On this particular through, axle or three or crank arm um, this is the Bontrager race this is the GXP model it is it's basically it copies the 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 Shimano version of this with the external bearings they are not interchangeable so keep that in mind so if you have a, a, a crank set like this the GXP you will need a GXP bottom bracket to go with it so I'm going to place these actually I want to these have two sides to them, and I want to make sure the metal side is on the inside of those cups there. And I want to put a little bit of grease on these guys so they stay in place, and it also gives it an extra barrier of protection 
of water and contaminants from getting in there. I did check these bearings and they seem to be just fine. They roll smooth. Once those are in place, then I go ahead and put the crank. And again, I like to put a layer of grease on these guys to make it all work better. There we go. And look for the other crank arm. What I do like about these is they do catch those spline while you're threading it on. And there will be a gap in here between the bearing and the crank. That is designed that way. It's kind of flared out. You can't really see it visually but it doesn't go up against it flush on that guy there so i need to put my cable guide back on which is this guy here that's basically screws in there and what i like to do is i like to put a little bit of grease on these tracks because that cable is going to be running up against those tracks in addition to i like to put a little bit of grease on the threads of so the screw that goes into the bottom reason being well, you hit any puddle of water, you know where it's going underneath. So any kind of a added protection and also performance enhancement is good to help you ride like the wind. All right. So got those two guys in place. Now I'm going to do the front derailleur. Um, this guy is what they call a direct mount meaning it doesn't have a clamp around it. This is a direct mount frame. Um, if you have a direct mount, you can also get the clamp that fits. And there's like three or four different sizes to a particular frame. So keep that in mind of that when you're, if you're parting in or putting together your bike from scratch. And you want this to be like two millimeters, the outside plate to be two millimeters over the big chain ring. When these are new, they have a little sticker that has a guide on there. And by doing that, you want to, once it's tight, you want to double check that, see if it's not bumping up. And right now it is, so I need to bring it up a little bit higher and parallel with the chain ring, like so. Voila. All right. So the rear derailleur I put on after I put the wheel on. Before I put the wheel on, I got to put on the cassette, right? So, and again, bearing grease is your friend. You want to put this in a lot of different spots of your bike. Um, you can get a tube of it, but you know, it doesn't go bad, so might as well get a tub. And you can use it for a lot of different things around the house too, which I've used mine for as well, between kids, toys, and fixing things of various nature. That is, and these are keyed, so it's gonna be one smaller notch than the rest. And since they're keyed, they only lay a certain direction. So you go from big to small. Make sure you put your spacers in there. Most of the time you visually can see the difference in the chain rings. Sometimes they get really tight and it was really like, oh, which one is it? Then you put it together then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this has a weird up down thing, which is not, not the best. But anywho, mistakes happen and we learn from our mistakes, right? Alrighty, so getting to the last two. Where are you? There you are. Teeth. And the last couple are already have built-in spacers. And what you want this to look like is kind of like, um, obviously the outside, the cog needs to be over the actual free hub body. Um, if it's flush, uh, below or flush, you're missing a spacer or something's not quite right. So that's what it wants to look like. And this guy actually had a Altegra Newer Altegra chain cassette. So, looks like to me this rear wheel either came off of a different bike or something happened to the rear wheel and they had to replace it. 
So they upgraded it. That's nice. Um, these race extra lights have titanium skewers too. So those are fancy and light. Um, I thought titanium was a rare metal until I started looking it up. And it's like, it's not that rare. It's just expensive to process or to make and to parts for maybe now it's just the stigma is titanium. <laughs> so I don't know. Cause I was thinking like, Oh, I mean, I should recycle this titanium. And I looked up the worth. I'm like, Oh, it's not, it's, I think aluminum's more expensive. Anyway, you want to get your wheel in there first before you do your alignment tool. I do this alignment on every bike that I work on because these derailleur hangers, they get sometimes skewed. Um, also, when they're brand new, they were usually a little off. So the bike builders of the bike shops that I worked at, we required them to double check the hangers and make sure they were straight because more often than not, they were off. So this one is off just a smidge. I need to be careful on this because it is not interchangeable. So if it breaks, the frame is toast. Well, back in the day, Trek was able to rebond new ones in there and you can probably get a company that does carbon and does the same, but you don't want to go through all that hassle. Usually when this portion is toast, the bike is done. It reminds me of the story. Story time! Back in the 90s, um, we were a Schwinn dealer, when Schwinn owned Schwinn, and um, which was kind of cool back then. Uh, Schwinn, Trek, Mongoose, and GT, I think was our primary lines. And we eventually picked up Fu Fuji and Jameis. But anyway, back to the story. Um, you know, you'd have a frame that's bad and so forth that kind of thing. And the Sh uh, Schwinn rep would come in and there were the ones that were supposed to take care of the warranties. Um, the outside rep. So you have this pile of stuff for the rep to go through and do whatever. Um, so they write up a credit and they're sitting there, yeah, literally write up a credit on a three piece, pa you know, three copied paper um, thing. And, and the funny thing was, is they would take that drop out of the frame and they demonstrate why not actually do, but to toast a frame that was warranty. Let's say this is a warranty frame. They'd go to a vice and put just the derailleur hanger drop out in there and they would whoop, bend it down. That's how they would destroy their frame. Well, if they didn't bend it quite right or whatever, you can hock that off and make it a single speed. But anywho, that's between you and me. I never did that. Never needed needed a reason for a single speed. But anywho, um, yeah, front wheel. That's what I was doing. Got, got distracted with my story. Yeah, so back in the 90s, that's how they took care of their warranties is, you know, by uh, bending that derailleur hanger, which, you know, fast forward a few years later, then they had tools to make those things straighten out. Not that he could straighten that thing out when it was bent over 90 degrees, um, but and back then, the frames were mostly steel. Once in a while, they have aluminum. So that's really dating myself back in time. Woo, back in time, back in time. So since I know that derailleur hanger is aligned, so this derailleur is going to fit parallel to the chain rings. So I'm gonna get this guy on there. So when the hanger is down and drop, you should be able to visually see a vertical plane with that small cog since there's no uh, chain ring on there. And I'm going to the front derailleur or front shifter brake lever. We're going to put this guy back on there like so, just a couple threads. So it just hangs there. Same thing with this guy. So on this one, since the housing seems to be fine, so I'm going to reuse the housing so it's not wasteful for the brakes. There we go. And by doing that, and since the one cable that I had from the back, if you watch the live version, this was rusty. I'm going to use two brand new cables, brake cables. So do that. You thread this through. 
like so. And get it in the housing. The reason why I'm doing that, that it guides it in there into the shifter itself. And remember, this shifter is still loose. And I put it in its cable guy, top tube, like so, and I give it a good tug, and that pushes that shifter into place. Then I proceed to tighten that down. So it's right up and butted up against that housing. Voila. And on to the front. <laughs> Whoop. Yeah, and I have these in bulk, so they're a case of a hundred, I think. Since I go through quite a few of them, that's the best pricing that I can do. Whoop. Okay, so I got that started. Now I did put a couple drops of oil on the housing itself, so it's actually lining the uh, inside of the brake lever. Like that, then again. Nice and tight position. And the reason being is the housing's all taped up here, so I'm trying to prevent from cutting that all off and redoing it, which is not necessary at this particular time. And that click is really just a snapping of the clamp inside, holding it in place. So, all right, we've got the shifters, derailers. Oh, I need to do the, these little guys, cable guides. They go on the down tube. So. Back in the day, this is where actually where the shifter was, this little lever that goes up and down kind of thing. And this has replaced it once the shifters got moved up to the actual brake lever called STI back in the day. So I take these apart, clean them on a cleaner, then I re -lube them so when you actually need to use them, you can actually use them. Um, sometimes these get seized up over contaminants of weather or what have you. Um, and some are just a booger to use. Oh, this one's kind of stiff. So I want to break it free first. There we go. And work that superior loop in there. So it's nice to have a barrel adjuster that you actually can use. Also, as a technical tip, we, uh, when, we had, when I had people build these, and including myself, we would grease these because these would come in a box and you'd have to thread it together. Well, now they're all come pre-assembled, so that does not happen half the time, but this does have grease on it. So you have to take them back off. They actually will come off. Um, sometimes they'll seize on there. Then you have to take a tire lever and really go at it and try to get those things to pop back into place. Like so, you tighten them down, not too tight, but you know enough to hold its position. And the chain, I'm gonna to have to cut to length um, to make sure it's the right length. I'm not gonna assume that this bike had the right chain length on there, so I always measure them beforehand. And back to the bottle cage mounts. The reason why I took those off and cleaned them is also to be able to get to um, the frame and access all that, but to ensure that these guys are in good working order because nothing worse than getting a bike and you can't mount a water bottle cage on there. Not the end of the world, they can be repaired, or if you like camelbacks, you can just ride with a camelback, but this becomes more like a accessory port. <laughs> Back in the day, you can put on bottle, you know, bottle cages, pumps, tools, and various other things. Um, used to be a a mount for battery for one of those old night suns. And the back of it, yeah, those were like super huge water bottle mount battery that went to a light that lit up everything. It was before LEDs really took off. So now 
that light that produces the same <laughs> light is probably a tenth of the size now, how technology has changed, um, which is great because you need light and actually running lights are actually a thing now, which is really cool. So people can see on the trails or on the bike paths or on the streets and they're small and compact and rechargeable for a lot of them. So those are all cleaned up and good to go. All right, pretty much all my parts are back on the bike. So after this, I'm just gonna be doing some stringing, which will take a little time. Cut that chain, put it on there, readjust it and wrap the bars and this baby is ready for its new owner. Yeah, this is a 54 centimeter WSD wind specific design uh, from Trek. Trek coined the WSD, um, it's just women specific. What that really means is it is a little bit smaller frame, but it does have a little bit narrower bars, women specific saddle. Um, those are the contact points that are the most important. And they usually had a little bit higher lift of um, a, a steer tube, which you can see the stack here, which makes it able to bring it up higher to accommodate a little bit better fit for the comp cockpit. Under the assumption that women's bodies are long laid and short torso. That is not the case. So you know, fast forward to today, um, Specialize is one of the companies that kind of ditched their whole women's specific design, same as Trek, and they're going to the concept of uh, neutral gender frame, and then you do those adjustments with the bars and the seat and all that when you purchase the bike or when you get a bike fit fitting or that kind of thing. So the world has evolved to that. So that's how the bikes are being made. That cuts down from you know six, seven SKUs for a men's model and another four or five for women's that knocks down four or five SKUs. And also on the bike shop level, you don't have to stock as many bikes to represent that one model, which is probably better in the long run. But for the consumer, it's probably a, a give and take um, because now you really kind of need to focus on bar width and stem uh, to accommodate you. So that's the added expense on that new bike as well as saddle, which pretty much is an added expense on any bike you purchase. Because saddles are kind of like seats, so keep that in mind. And also when you're looking at used and new, fit is the first thing you need to look for. Is the bike the right size for you? If it's not the right size, doesn't matter what kind of deal that you got or what have you, you're not gonna enjoy it, it's not gonna fit you right, you're not, you're not, it's just no bueno, not good, just don't do it. Make sure the bike fits you. Uh, once the bike fits you, then you can go crazy with everything else. Uh, but yeah, the bars is in stem and seat is your main contact points because this is your hands position with your upper body. This is obvious your keister. You wanna make sure that is happy when you go for those longer rides. And the pedals is another thing too. Also another thing too is crank, crank arm length, but they also kind of shrink and shortness when they go to a smaller frame or to bigger for bigger frames. 175 is the longest ones. 165 is one of the shorter ones. If you need to get shorter than that, there's custom builders that make um, smaller cranks or uh, engineer crank builders out there that make shorter, shorter ones. So anywho, thank you for spending time with me in the garage. This is the Trek 5000 OCLV WSD 54 centimeter about ready to hit the ground. Until next time, have a great day. Thanks for being out with me.